I'm always thrilled to be at Paley Fest. I'm so excited that season two starts shooting this Wednesday. It's back on the air in June. Um, so we're gonna start just by introducing everybody and then begin our conversation. So we have some great people here. I'm gonna um, ask you to give them big rounds of applause. First up, please welcome supervising producer and writer, Our Lady J. So in the writer's room, all of us kind of have characters that we act out. This is the one that I act out every day as Electra Abundance, Dominique Jackson. <laughs> as our beloved angel, please welcome India Moore. Um, our next special guest is an old friend of mine. Um, he's a Tony Award winner. He's an icon now as Pray Tell Billy Porter. As Blanca Rodriguez, please welcome MJ Rodriguez. MJ! <clears throat> please welcome co creator and executive producer Stephen Canals. And lastly, please welcome the director of this episode the co-executive producer, writer, director extraordinaire, Miss Janet Mock. <clears throat> so I wanna start with Janet. I'm gonna turn my chair around here. So Janet, um, this is such an amazing episode of television and it was your um, directorial debut. So were you nervous? Were you frightened before you did it? What were you feeling? I was feeling doubtful. You were? Yeah, I think that, you know, so often, um, I've never seen someone like me helming an episode of television, um, writing a screenplay, um, directing a feature. And so when you asked me, no, actually you didn't ask. I told her. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when my boss told me that I was directing, um, I was, just really doubtful and nervous. I didn't know if I had the skill set. I didn't know if, I know I didn't have the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what great mentorship does, which is what you are to me, um, is that you alley me in a way that enabled me to slam dunk, right? Mm -hmm. Like you set me up in a way that you allowed me to shadow another female director um, Gwyneth Horder Payton, who was directing episode four, which was a script that I wrote. So I got to be on set with her. She's phenomenal. You inducted me into the Half Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and which, exactly. Um, and then you were there the night when I started mm -hmm. to get the crew on the same page to support me because you don't do any of this stuff alone, right? And so that was something that I learned. And I think from the very beginning, it felt like a very spiritual meant to be kind of thing, love is the message. And I think so often about that first phone call you gave me mm -hmm. out of the shower. Mm -hmm. What was that for you when, you when the whole story just came to you? Um, well, there's, there's a, there's a this, this was I believe episode six of, of the season. Um, and there's always that moment when you're writer's room and the first couple are always pretty easy because you're excited and fresh and new and then you're like a tired old hoe and you're just exhausted. And <laughs> you're like, how am I gonna get through this season? And we were at that phase in the writer's room where we were looking for bits of inspiration and um, we were kind of stuck, as I recall. We were 
just thinking about a lot of different directions to go. And I have always loved this show so much because, you know, I grew up in this period and I lost many, 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 many friends to AIDS. And I came of age sexually during this time. So I've never not associated sex with death. Um, so we were just talking about the stories and nothing was clicking and I went, I got up one morning and I took a shower and I was in the shower and suddenly everything that you see in this episode just came into my head to the point where I, I was sort of stunned and I turned off the water and I ran and I got a piece of paper and nude, I wrote out the whole thing <laughs> and, and it was just sort of a, a gift and I felt, um, not to get too emotional, but I felt that all of those that we lost were um, very involved in the making of this episode in terms of spiritually. So uh, it, was, it was heavy and it was a joy and it was, um, it was beautiful. I've only had that one other time in my life, which was episode four of this season. So it's interesting. I believe in asking for a way sometimes. So for Janet, the thing that I also was so amazed and so proud about is we live in a world where there's so much television. There's, I think this year, close to 600 shows now airing in this country, which means there's over 60,000 episodes of television that airs. And um, the thing that made me almost weep, in fact, I did weep when I found it out, is um, Matt zoller Zeitz of New York Magazine and many other critics said that Janet's directorial debut was the best single episode of television of 2018. Which is an amazing accomplishment. So on the flip side, you started off unsure and then you got to the end of the year and you felt all of that affirmation coming at you. How do you feel now about it? Did it change you, the success of it? It did, yeah. Um, in the sense of not to stop doubting myself just because I haven't done it before doesn't mean that I don't have all of the skill set and mm -hmm. the experiences and all of the things that I went through to help me sit behind there and prosper. I know how to tell the story. I know who these characters are. I know these actors. I'm on set with them every single day. <clears throat> so why can't I? This is my home too, mm -hmm. right? And so just because there's never been a blueprint before doesn't mean that it's not possible for me to do. And so I hope that what this episode does, which is what you always said, was that this show, this particular episode, was a memorial mm -hmm. to those people. And so I hope that, as Praytel says, as Billy Porter says at the end of the episode, it's about choosing to fight. I'm choosing to live, that's who I am. That's mm -hmm. what I wanna do. And so I hope it pushes everyone to want to live their life as much as they can, to be uncomfortable, to be afraid, but still dare out to go outside like these characters do, right? And these women do, and Billy does. They step outside of their homes every single day with so much threat <clears throat> around them, so much threats of violence. Just because you're famous doesn't mean that that changes, right? And so I think that our show gives that to people, and I hope that people feel that love and that energy that we put into it. I think they do. So for Steven, um, yes, a round of applause for Jen. <laughs> so the, the story of how Pose came together, I'll give you the um, very brief Wikipedia version. Um, Brad Falchuk and I were um, working on a, loosely working on a television adaptation of Paris is Burning. And we got the rights to Paris is Burning, the Ginny Livingston documentary from the late 80s. And as we started to write it, it was an interesting experience for us because it didn't feel, we weren't kind of in the zone. And as we started to do more research, we found that some, I, almost everyone in that beloved film has passed. And we found out that many of the families of the survivors were not comfortable with their stories being told because we were gonna not fictionalize them, but tell them very specifically. So I put the project on hold and I was bummed. And two days later, Sherry Marsh sent me Stephen's script. So I felt, again, sometimes, sometimes these things just come at you in such a, a way that's a gift. And Stephen, for you, you had been trying to sell the story for a while. You had believed in the story for a while, but you kept hearing no. So what were people saying to you? Well, there was a lot of very coded language. It was too urban. 
Um, it was, <laughs> which we know what that means. Uh, it was too niche. Um, you know, it was a period piece. And so it, it felt as if this was a project that just had everything going against it. Um, and I have always felt in my heart of hearts that this show would make it to air if there was someone who was a disruptor and someone who uh, genuinely cares about not only equality but equity. And those would be the things that would help it get to the air. And so I don't think it's by chance that it landed on your desk and that we're now sitting here at the Paley Fest. Yeah. And how many, how many no's did you get? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds? I mean, I wrote the original draft when I was working on my MFA at, in screenwriting at UCLA, and this was in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> go Bruins. And um, <laughs> yeah, and you figure, I didn't meet you until the tail end of 2016. So that was a solid two years of going in and out of offices and pitching this project and talking about it and just being told no. That's fascinating to me that I didn't know it was that many people. Yeah, it was a lot of people. But, <laughs> you know, but what's great is that very first meeting that we had, um, it was a mm. week after you had won a slew of Emmys for The People versus O.J. Simpson. <laughs> um, I had some clout in that moment. <laughs> um, and I just remember being really nervous going into your office to meet with you. And, and Sherry was like, you're going to be OK. Um, and in my, I've never told you this, but in my bag, I had the, there was an issue of Entertainment Weekly that had been released uh, just before the Emmys. And Ryan was on the cover. And it was talking about you know, the, the Ryan Murphy television empire. Um, and so for good luck, I put that. You did? That is back. the sweetest story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we sat and we talked, you know, and. So Steven. We can, it's a very, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, the universe will come through and. <laughs> That's why we always say he's Blanca. <laughs> I'm like, I have to believe somewhere yeah. in my heart this is going to happen. <laughs> and Ryan Murphy's going to pluck this poor boy from the Bronx out of obscurity. <laughs> And that's exactly what happened because of <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's the very difficult thing about show business that I always um, feel. And I felt it very when I was starting, you know, I had a very I had a very interesting career where, you know, I tried to write what was what I thought would be popular or commercial. And it wasn't until I wrote something that was just a story that I wanted to tell, even if it was just for me, that I had any success. And I always tell young people, because I'm now elderly, that um, <laughs> you know, it only takes one yes to change your life. Mm. Only one. And, and I remember when Stephen came in, and I had read it, and I had loved him in the room. I'm like, OK, well, we're going to do it. And he said, wait, that's it? And I said, yeah. And I had been very lucky in my relationship you know, with Fox, with Dana Walden and John Landgraf, because they pretty much, pretty much believe in everything that I'm trying to do with the with my work. And and at this point in my work, I'm trying to do things that make the world a better place. To be blunt, so it was a great, it was a great beginning. And other things that are gifts to me in my life, like Janet, like Stephen, um, was the casting of this show, because we spent. We spent six months casting the show, and we made the casting process open to everybody in the world, literally. Anybody who wanted to audition could audition. And that was very important to Stephen and I and Brad as we were casting it. And we spent so many fun times, trips to New York, seeing people. And one of the great, most memorable moments that I had, Miss MJ, was MJ had auditioned several times. And as soon as she read, we were like, well, that's it. You know, that's just it. And but it's a process. And we wanted everybody, the studio, the network, to feel ownership of, as well over the creative direction of the show. So finally, I got to make the calls. And MJ, I called you when you were in your parents' house. Yes. So talk about that phone call for you. <laughs> OK, so I mean, I was at like a complete limbo in my life. I didn't, Were you? Yeah, I didn't know what was going on. This is like a therapy session. It All is. this stuff that I <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Um, I was in this place where I was auditioning like crazy. I didn't know if my identity was gonna match up with my career. I didn't know if anyone was gonna take a chance on me. And when you called me that day, I kind of like gagged because not only was I listening to Rihanna's Wild Thoughts on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> now you called and you said, what are you doing? I said, I'm listening to Rihanna Wild Thoughts on my computer. But it also just, <laughs> it opened up a space and you just, you gave me an opportunity. You, you saw a chance in me. You gave, you gave me a chance to finally feel like my identity matched my career choice. And, you know, people were going to take me seriously as an actress when you did that. Mm -hmm. And I feel, knowing you now for uh, almost two years, the thing that I love about watching your evolution is you're so confident now. Yeah. You're so in the world in a way that when I met you, I, I remember when I was directing you in the pilot, I kept saying, you're amazing. Just be, push yourself, get out there more. And I'm so proud of you that you've done that, that you've really, you've really, Take an ownership of your success. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, one of the things that I like to do at Paley Fest is talk about upcoming things that we have for season two. Season two is very exciting. It starts in 1990, 8990. It's a time leap. It starts the day Madonna releases Vogue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, Along with our wonderful cast, um, we have new additions. Sandra Bernhard is a season regular this yeah. season. So MJ, I want to tell you and everybody, guess who you have a lot of scenes with this season? Sandra. Well, no? yes. OK, I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, you'll like this, because you're a Broadway person. You love Broadway. You're, okay. You have a musical theater background. Yes. You have many, many, many scenes with Patti LuPone. <laughs> So do you, Billy Porter. Don't worry, it's all gonna work out. You guys can show off your Tonys and have a moment. And, but yeah, we, we've, we've come up with this great role for, for two-time Tony winner, Miss Patti LuPone, who I will tell you was the flower girl at my wedding, which is a hilarious story, but that's <laughs> um, But yeah, she loves the show and, and we wrote this part and she said, yes, I wanna do it. So she's coming to play with us in a couple weeks. Oh. So, um, Billy Porter. <laughs> 10, 10. So I've known Billy for a while. Greg Berlanti is a friend of mine, and, and I, was, um, yeah, he w I was around him when he was writing Broken Hearts Club, which Billy starred in for Greg. So the thing that I want to talk about first is the thing that I know you all want to talk about, which is the Oscar outfit. So I want to talk about that. I want to break that down because <laughs> Billy showed me the sketches of this amazing tuxedo gown um, a couple weeks, not even a couple weeks, I think the week yeah. before he went on the air and I was stunned and loved it. And I was watching it happen on the internet which literally exploded. So talk about your decision and what that was like for you and what it was about for you because People are obsessed with that. It's instantly iconic. You became a fashion icon overnight, I feel, because of you always were, but that one Luke, as you call it. <laughs> so talk about that. Well, I, you know, the journey to authenticity has been very long. And I remember, you know, back in the 90s when my career was on the rise the first time. And... <laughs> And I was trying to be an R&B recording artist and the music business being violently homophobic and everything that I tried to do, every way that I tried to express myself was silenced, right? So I spent, you know, from 2000 for a decade going, okay, I lost my voice. I didn't even know how I lost that. 
What is it? How do I get it back? And how do I honor myself going forward in this business? That masquerades as being inclusive, because let's be real. We're all masquerading as being inclusive. It's easy to be who you are, but what you are is what's popular. Authenticity is fine when authenticity is what everybody likes. The minute that your authenticity, you know, it's like, so, so there was a, there was a, this thing going on with me for many, 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 many years, right? So I get this opportunity. I get this thing, this new wave, this new chance, you know, starting with, you know, coming back to, to the theater in 2010 with the first revival of Angels in America, then into Kinky Boots, then, then this. And it's like, all of a sudden, my choice for authenticity that kept me broke for decades <laughs> was, was all of a sudden turning around, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, this is cool, right? And so then, you know, the, 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 the idea of, you know, because my masculinity was always in question, right? That's the thing. That's the thing when you're a gay man. Your masculinity is in question. Your masculinity is up for discussion. And when that is up for discussion, that means that you're not going to get that masculinity job. You're not going to get that, you know, butch job. And, and those are the jobs that exist. So we all try to sort of fit into this paradigm of that existence so that we can work. Mm -hmm. That's how you worked, right? So all of a sudden, different stories are being told. All of a sudden, all of that stuff that I chose, I chose my sanity over my fame. And all of a sudden, this man comes along and is like, I need you to play Pray Tell. Like, it was like, oh my God. Like, I never, I always had huge dreams, right? But I never, they were always springboarded off of things that I had already seen. What this man has allowed me the opportunity to do is understand how to dream the impossible. <clears throat> so, it's the truth. So here I am. I'm in this space, experiencing the impossible. The phone rings. They're like, we want you to host the red carpet at the Oscars, right? I used to sit around, I used to sit around with my friends who are here today, Ron, Ron Pittywell, Keena Dorsey, Benita Harbour, my best friends sitting right over there. And we used to literally just like, oh girl, I can't wait till I can wear a ball gown to the Oscars. I'm gonna wear a ball gown. Watch, bitch. Watch, bitch. I'm gonna wear a ball gown. You know, like, kind of halfway joking. You know, like, joking because, like I said, that's impossible. Like, you know, I'm saying it, I'm speaking it, and still thinking internally that it's, that it's impossible. And then the opportunity came, and I was like, oh, bitch, you gotta wear that ball gown. <laughs> you gotta wear the ball gown, you gotta wear the ball gown. Like, this is the moment. I remember sitting and watching um, the, the year Adina Menzel was on the Oscars, and uh, old boy said her name wrong. What's his name? Um, John, Travolta. John Travolta. John Travolta said his name, said her name wrong. And I said, oh my God. She just went from like being a really, really known person to a household name because a bitch said her name wrong <laughs> on the Oscar. I said, I need to get to the Oscar. <laughs> so when the call came, I was like, oh bitch, this is that Oscar moment I need. This is that Oscar moment. I called it up into the universe, right? So we happened to be in Fashion Week. I was doing, I was the ambassador for Fashion Week and, in New York City, and I had gone to Christian Siriano's show, and I'd been, we had been trying to connect with Christian, uh, Christian Janet, and I had been trying to connect, and I've always loved him, and I was like, oh, I want to wear a gown, like, 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 like. and. You know, I went to the party and we were dancing on the dance floor and I just whispered in his ear because, you know, once again, the idea of we masquerading as being inclusive, right? The fashion houses, you know, at the beginning of all of this stuff, many of the fashion houses would not send over female clothes for me. Well, that's not what he should be wearing, right? But I saw this before. 
I remember what I remember <laughs> hearing that 25 years ago. That's just a silencing technique. So fuck you. That's not what we're doing anymore. I'm gonna find somebody who's gonna do it. And I knew, I was like the only one, who, the only person that's gonna do it if anybody will do it and do it in a week, cause it was a week out, <laughs> would be Christian. So we're dancing on the dance floor. I'm like, bitch, I gotta, I gotta Oscar, I gotta <laughs> invite to the Oscars. Da, da, invite to the Oscars. <laughs> I wanna wear a ball gown. He was like, yeah! <laughs> he said, girl, call me Monday. <laughs> call the office on Monday. And that was it. That was it. It was on. It was on. One, one other question for Billy that, you know, this part was an amazing journey for all of us because in the original pilot script, Billy's character did not exist. There was a, there was a part called MC and it had five lines. So I said to Alexa Fogel, <laughs> who's our brilliant casting director, we talked about it. I'm like, just, just have Billy come in and just talk to us. So we get this. <laughs> and I turned around to Brad and Steven and I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and so they, like all of you right now, are just like amazing, yes, <laughs> superstar. So we, Steven and Brad and I went and we wrote that part for Billy Porter. We, we wrote it for Billy Porter. And you know, and it was the part that I felt Billy Porter deserved and, and would kill, and I just knew it. And as soon as I did the first line in the pilot, I was like, okay, well, this is gonna happen. And a couple episodes in, um, I think it was right before this episode, I went back and we were talking to Billy, and I said to him, um, so you're the male lead of the show and blah, 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 and he said, I'm not the male lead. And I said, you are the male lead. And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, you are the fucking male lead of this show. And it was a very emotional moment between the two of us. Can you talk about that if you can talk about it? Take a minute. Um, and I was, I was very moved and shocked that you didn't feel that and didn't know that after something was written and tailored for you. Yeah. Um, The journey, the journey to this place has been so wrought with homophobia, terror, rejection in the hardest and darkest ways. So for my sanity, I adopted an energy that is expect nothing. Expect nothing so that you're always surprised. And when you're surprised, that keeps you, go that keeps you going. When I was in college at Carnegie Mellon in 1987, the first thing they say to you is, you have to be authentic. You have to know who you are to be a great actor. You have to, you have to go in and know who you are, and that's the only way that you're gonna be a great actor. And then in the next breath, they turned to all of the gay boys in the room and said, except you faggots over there. Y'all have to change. Y'all have to be different. You can't be who you are. It's never gonna work. So I spent then the next 20 years, 25 years, Believing that, James Baldwin said, it took many years before I could vomit up the stuff that people told me about myself, and I halfway believed before I had the, the, the courage to walk on this earth as if I had the right to be here. That was what that journey was. So... I just, I, it never even occurred to me. It never even occurred to me because the energy that I had al always received was, you can't, you're not a leading man. You're not, a, that's never gonna be a leading man. Now, 
They said at Carnegie Mellon, you could be a leading man if you change. They were casting me as Romeo. But I was like, but where am I going to work? You know, the archetypes are James Earl Jones as the patriarch. Uh, 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 Denzel Washington as the sex symbol, and Eddie Murphy as the genius clown. Many of, many of those people inside of those archetypes were already violently homophobic. So if I wanted to work, I had to be the side queen who was the best friend of somebody who could be the clown that everybody could be comfortable with, you know, I can be the sissy clown and everybody's comfortable with that. But the minute it's time to tell the real story, go somewhere, right? So I'm, so I'm, still, in that, I'm still in that trauma space. I got the gig. <laughs> you know, I got the, you know, the man said yes, the one in the position of power came and said, no, you're the one and now we're gonna do this. And I, it still took me, I'm still in it. I'm still working through like, Oh shit, right. <laughs> like, this is actually happening. Like, this is really, really happening. Like, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. That's one of the amazing things about this show is that it's a first in so many ways. And I think it, it's broken so many rules and it's, um, it's extraordinary in the way that it's like this little engine that could, and I can feel it, and every week and every month it gets bigger and bigger, and people are finding it, and it's growing. And one of the interesting things for me is meeting and casting someone like India Moore. <laughs> and the, the second India walked in the door, game over. <laughs> uh, we knew she was the one. And the, you know, the thing about India that I have um, admired, because I don't, when I was starting out, I did not have that in me, was just this bravery that is, took me a while to wrap my head around it. And that India, you, to me, you know, are now a fashion queen and an icon. And, but more than that, you're somebody who instantly used your fame and your success as a platform for activism. And the thing, um, we're talking about the Oscars. We're talking about who didn't host the Oscars. You know, India was one of the people in the world who was very involved, I think, with, with um, shining a light on that situation. So talk about that for you, India. Have you always been this way? Have you always been so brave? Have you always felt so sure? Um. Uh, I think most of my life, that's how I survived, mm. uh, was by uh, being brave and um, uh, asking questions where I was uh, um, expected not to talk back. Um, I, I've experienced a lot of um, Uh, I've, 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 I've been through a lot of um, being uh, kicked out of spaces that I was supposed to find safety in and um, love and like spaces that I was made to believe were meant for me to be in, um, I was rejected from. So um, I think that created a spark um, between me and um, my, my awareness to how much of that happens in the world mm -hmm. on, a, on a larger scale. And, and that helped me to understand how people are marginalized. Um, people are told that they don't get to have the same access as others um, simply because they're different than whatever status quo was, was created mm -hmm. um, to benefit whoever um, created that status quo. Um, so continuing on, um, as I went through the, the things that I'd um, gone through, um, I was just 
really uncomfortable and upset by the world that I lived in and how it contributed to the experiences that I had. And um, I wanted to leverage my awareness um, to uh, affect change in any way that I can. Um, but that um, was a battle, uh, an internal one. There are a lot of internalized uh, shame that I've, that I've had to uh, navigate throughout a lot of my life. Um, even when I got casted for um, Angel, before I got casted for Angel, when I first uh, saw the character descriptions, I wanted to um, go for Blanca because I didn't want to be a sex worker. And uh, playing a sex worker for me um, brought back uh, memories and, and things that I'd already put behind me. And um, I didn't want to revisit, you know, like I, uh, I was so ashamed of some of the, um, some of the things that I'd went through. Um, and taking on Angel uh, made me unpack a lot of the shame that I felt mm -hmm. and also challenged me um, in ways that made me feel like I wasn't um, as secure as I thought I was in, in different places. Who do you admire right now? Is there, is there another young person, another activist that you look up to that you think um, is pretty amazing? I appreciate Viola Davis um, for <laughs> the ways that, you know, she, she simultaneously holds her position as an actor, but also speaks mm -hmm. to um, realities that are going on. Um, but I wanted to go back to um, uh, my experience around playing Angel as a sex worker and how that transformed my perspective about how important representation was, even for myself. Um, I never knew that as someone that was an ad on Backpage before, an ad on Craigslist, um, uh, kicked out of different spaces, choosing to leave different spaces, being exploited as a, as a, as a teenager, um, going through uh, being sex trafficked and ending up having a criminal record and then uh, trying to escape my reality through drug abuse that uh, I would end up here. And uh, playing Angel forced me to interrogate those parts of my life that I've never spoken about and uh, actually dealt with. Um, I just kind of moved past it. And um, facing that reality made me feel insecure. Um, like, I was thinking about what um, MJ said about how she, you know, she found confidence and security through, like, her journey. And I feel like through this journey, because of the things that it forced me to unpack, I lost a lot of my security, I think, because of how I created my sense of security by walking away from those things. Um, so then I realized how important representing um, sex workers were, people who um, had went through the experiences that I had and that um, how much a part of my existence and my journey was intertwined with um, challenging uh, who, what society um, makes people feel like they deserve, uh, makes people feel like who deserves and, and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
And I realized, um, and, and uh, people that have come into my life and loved me for who I am helped me to realize that it's really important for us not to allow the experiences that we have and uh, people who uh, speak into our life to question our magic because it can <laughs> if you do that, then it can take away from what you're able to create impact or change with that magic, I think. And so I'm still, um, I don't know, like I shift um, all the time, like my confidence shifts. Like even, I mean, like my life has changed so rapidly and I've, I've chosen to take on so much. Um, and I think in, interrogating my experiences and my history has helped me to become a, a better advocate and um, listening to the stories of the people around me, like um, other people around, I don't know if I'm speaking to you, sorry, but like Dominique, you know, also, she, um, like hearing her story and how similar it was to mine um, made me uh, feel less alone. And I made me also think about all the India Moors and all the Dominique Jacksons that to this day, still trying to su survive off whatever they can, um, makes me think about how it is possible for them to be a healer or a doctor, a teacher, a scientist, a politician, um, or whoever. Beautifully said. So I, I just appreciate. So speaking of uh, Dominique, Dominique, um, also walked in the room and was like, okay, well, we're done there. That, um, I spoke earlier of, of my obsession with this character. And Dominique, I wanted to ask you, what has it been like for you to play a villain? I didn't realize I was a villain. <laughs> Well said. <laughs> um, Electra is that character that I feel that a lot of us don't realize that we have within ourselves. Mm. And we don't realize that that strength that we have, that pushback that we have, that, that pushback that becomes the dominance that we use to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. For many of us, for me, I realized that when I became assertive and even at times rude, which I regretted, people stood up and took notice. Mm. They didn't understand or comprehend or acknowledge when I was able to, when I was being that person that said, okay, we're all gonna hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> but Electra taught me being a lecturer, playing that part taught me that it is okay to be strong. It is okay to be assertive, but you just don't have to be that damn mean. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you, uh, what, what is on your wish list for season two? What is something that you personally would hope Electra gets to do? So let me go by my contract. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Uh, but um, no, for, um, for, season, for season two, I, I honestly trust in the writing of Janet Mark and Stephen Canals and Our Lady J and Mr. Murphy and Brad Fulshark. And I realized that sometimes we have to let go. It's always this saying, because I do come from the church at times, right? <laughs> and... It is that saying that you have to let go and let God. But sometimes we don't realize that God speaks to other people. And he has other people that are his messengers. So I have to let go and allow the creative genius that is the writing team to do what they do best. 
because I already believe and I already know and I trust wholeheartedly because as a member of the ballroom community, as someone who was on the other side, looking up, wishing and wanting and praying to have an opportunity. As an illegal immigrant for many years, I didn't think that I could ever get to a place like this. But I had to realize that I had to have faith. It wasn't about what religion I believed in. It wasn't about who I worshiped. It was about me just having faith in knowing that there was something in the universe that was going to bless me, that was going to take me to where I needed to be. And that is... <clears throat> and so therefore, I know <laughs> that Electra is going to be Electra. <laughs> Very good. She's Electra. <laughs> so for um, Our Lady J, one of the things that I love about the show is that um, uh, I think people were shocked at the kindness of the show, about the fairy tale, tale element of the show, how Janet and Stephen and Our Lady J talked about this a lot, that I think when people started to write it, they thought every episode was going to end in a death. And we were very conscious of not doing that. We wanted to write from a place of hope and inspiration. But one of the things that we felt then and still feel very um, strong about is writing honestly about the HIV crisis, which happened in the late 80s, early 90s, and continues on today. And in the room, our Lady J is always such an advocate for that kind of storytelling. Can you talk about that, your experience, and why you're so passionate, and how you're feeling about that? Yeah. Um, in 2004, I was living in an abandoned building in Brooklyn, and I found out that I had HIV. And my choices to live authentically, my choices to not live authentically, had led me to a place where I was at rock bottom. And I took, um, one night I was going to throw all of my things out of the window of this abandoned building, which included a mattress and a few boxes. And um, instead, I went and I, I ran across the Williamsburg Bridge. And I had a mantra. As I was running, I said, I'm going to survive. I'm going to thrive. I'm going to survive. I'm going to thrive. And that became, I am surviving. I am thriving, I am surviving, and I am thriving. And whenever I read the pilot for this, um, that you, uh, Ryan and Stephen and Brad had written, um, I had been asked to come on as a writer, coming off of Transparent. I didn't know that HIV was gonna be a huge part of the story. And I read, in the pilot, Blanca pretty much says that. Um, that's her energy. I am surviving, I am thriving, I'm going to survive, I'm going to thrive, I'm going to create a family, I'm going to pick myself up. And so I knew that there was an authentic authenticity in this piece that had never existed outside of what I had felt, and I felt that there was a magic and a spirit to this piece that was going to um, have that energy. And so in the writer's room, whenever HIV um, comes up as a storyline, um, you know, I shared, I think, in the first week of writing my, my status and my experience. Um, I know that we have that responsibility as a room to create that um, resilience, which is really the truth of, of what most people who are living with HIV um, experience. Um, and it's not something that's ever been, been told through two leads who are HIV positive mm -hmm. on a show. Um, so to stay out of the tragedy and into the experience of living rather than the experience of, of dying is um, something the world needs to see. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, one of the, uh, the, the other amazing things about the gift that is this show is, is um, gay people, trans people, we really have no, I won't say no, but we don't have a large written history, an archive. Um, 
there have been so many deaths and so much has been lost about this period. And I always feel that writing about AIDS and HIV is such a powerful thing to do. And I see it on this show. It started for me when I directed The Normal Heart and the night that that aired, so many young people were online asking questions about, did that really happen? How could we not know that that really happened? So one of the beautiful things about this show, I think, is the fact that we can say it really did happen and we really do remember, mm -hmm. which is such a powerful message, I think, to put out into the world. The last thing I want to say, um, that deserves applause. <laughs> the last thing I want to say before we get to the Q&A por portion is Janet Mock directed, um, obviously, this show. She also directed one of the episodes of The Politician, which is a show that's coming out in September, the start of Ben Platt. And Gwyneth Paltrow and Jessica Lange and I announced pretty much the cast on Friday, but Janet will also be directing um, season two episodes. So Janet, how do you also feel about directing Bette Midler and Judith Light? <laughs> Who will also, they, they, they are going to be in season one of The Politician and in season two as well. So I wanted to get that out there tonight. That's my diva update. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's take some, can you guys see? I can't see very well, but let's take some questions. I can kind of see. Hi. Very rarely do you ever come face to face with someone you admire and look up to. And for me, that's you, Mr. Murphy. And I just, I really want to thank you for, there's a, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and BS in Hollywood, but you are the real deal. And I really want to thank you. Thank you. For, um, you actually, you gave me my first job, which was a teeny tiny, awesome, incredible experience part um, on an episode of Glee. And um, I, this year, I, I'm, my name's Cody Carrera, and I'm an actor and a singer and a writer, and I applied to the HAP Initiative. And I wanted to ask Ms. Mock and you as well, or anyone on the panel, who I also want to thank um, for coming here, to talk a little bit about that, your experience, why you started it. And I actually have a gift bag for everyone. <laughs> If I could give it to you as a, as a thank you and a congratulations very on, sweet. on season two. Um, I, can, I can answer that question very early. I started the Half Initiative in my co company because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed of myself. Um, I'm a gay man. I, like Billy Porter, fought at the beginning of my career. I was told I could not be gay one of my first agents at the time in the late eighties was fired for being gay. So like Billy, I sort of came of age in a very um, stig stigmatized manner. And I had to fight to direct, you know, my own show, um, which was popular, um, which was 1998. And so then I sort of had some success and I was doing um, The People versus O.J. Simpson and we had a female director slated to do episode six, which was called Marsha, 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 that Sarah Paulson killed. And the director fell out. She broke her knee, I believe, and she had to have surgery. And so we were looking around and I said, well, you know, I know Sarah so well, I'll just do it. And halfway through, I thought, this is just not right. This is Sarah's killing it as I knew she would, but this should have been done by a woman. So then I looked at my roster and I was, doing, I was doing a little better than the industry average, which was, I believe at that time, a little more than 12%. And I just said, that's ridiculous. And I had just had two children and I was bringing them to the set and I wanted them to see the world, not that we lived in, but the world that I wanted them to live in. So I just made a decision in that moment that from this moment on, I was going to hire 50% of all the directors in my um, shows would be women, would be people of color, would be gay people, would be trans women. And I just, I didn't, I, I, I didn't ask for permission, I just did it. <laughs> and it's been honestly the best thing that I've ever done in my career. It's the thing that I'm the most proud of in my career. And what I'm always moved by is, is you know, as I was with Janet, was just the idea of so many people just need the opportunity to show what they can do. And the business is designed, you know, nobody ever wanted to mentor me, ever. You know, I sold my first script to Steven Spielberg. Um, and I am friends with Steven now, but I remember that feeling of thinking like, well, why is he not taking me under his wing in, in a way? Like, I really craved that and I wanted that. And I did not have that as a younger person. So. 
it was important for me to, to do that and give back. So I'm glad you're, you have applied. And, and Janet, you talk about your experience. Um, I'll keep it quick so that we can get more questions in, but um, it really was just me being able to sit in a van with a director when she was going to scout, right? So it was going on location scout, seeing how she translated what was on the script to the actual space that she was gonna work in, how she communicated that to her first AD, what conversations they were having. If she was able to have the cinematographer with her, Simon Dennis, then I got to hear them have those conversations. It really is just being kind of like a leech and just kind of soaking in all of the amazing experiences that she had um, at that time. And then also then we come to set and it's the days when we're shooting and seeing that she shows up 30 minutes before call time. So she's already eaten before the cast comes and you know, the crew there. I never do that. And she, no, he <laughs> doesn't. <laughs> well. But I admire it. <laughs> You know, and all those little intricacies of how you can have a mo the most efficient day and be as prepared as possible because when you're directing, it's just answering a lot of questions and sometimes you don't have the right answer, but they just need it fast. So it's like, you know, do you want a yellow or blue dress? And it's just blue, you know, it doesn't really matter, but to them it's everything, right? So it's like, you have to just make these mm -hmm. decisions every single day and you have to be quick because people are depending on you and your answer. And you know, along the lines I will say to you, as I believe this so firmly in my life, is such a tribute to this idea that I really believe if you want something badly enough and you ask the universe for it, it may take a while, but you will get it. Yeah. And along that line, um, I just want to say, you know, Janet Mock is a first time director, Stephen Canals is also going to be directing, Billy Porter is going to be directing, our lady Jay is going to be directing. So. Keep fighting, keep trying. I have to walk up. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say thank y'all for getting the stories right. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I am legendary Aniche Ebony. I'm a part of the ballroom team. I, um, I'm the commentator on the West Coast, so Billy, Mr. Porter, I live your life on the show. Everything you've been through, your character been through, I live. And I just want to thank you for playing that part right. Um, I want to thank you too, India, because I also was escorted and I was on drugs too. And I'm living a sober life now, but I also do music. And to see you sitting up there, that makes me know that I can make it too. So now I just wanted to ask you, Mr. Porter, um, what have you done? Like, what was your preparations to get ready for your role to play the commentator? Because you know it's I a lot. I lived it, honey. I lived it. You know, I, I, I was... <sighs> I came out in 85, um, moved to New York in 1990. So I was there. I was in New York. I lost, you know, more friends by the age of 21 than my grandmother at 83. You know, like the preparation for this part was my life. Now, I was never in the ball community per se. I was ball culture adjacent. <laughs> you know, I would never walk those balls. Trust and believe I was not at the time ready to walk those balls. But, um, you know, Paris is Burning came out, I think I was like 20. And it really just, it was the first time that any of us had seen ourselves. You know, once again, going back to representation, that idea of representation, it was the first time I literally had ever seen somebody that remotely looked and acted and behaved like I, like, had the same sensibility. So I've just been pre preparing for it my whole life. It was, it's like a glove. It really is like a glove. Um, so yeah, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the back. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for doing this show. I think it's about time to put transgender actresses and uh, drag actors into screen. Thank you so much for creating this. It's, I, I feel like it's like a selfie of, the, of back in the day, but the selfie got to stretch mm -hmm. into a whole series. And for that, I thank you, all of you. And uh, now that you all made it, I want to know what's your favorite thing to do to, um, to deal with rejection, because all of you has, have been rejected. 
What's your favorite thing to do to get out of that mood, to, 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 to get out of rejection mode? Well, honey, I, I will say this to you. First off, you look amazing. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. You represent well, but more than well. <laughs> but here's the thing. Especially, you have to understand where you're going. You have to understand where you want to go and what you want to do. And a part of that in becoming an actor, in being an actor, is realizing that sometimes there will be things that are not for you. Mm -hmm. And even in life, we don't understand. We pursue things at times and we're going, this is for me, this is for me. And the signs are saying to you, no, baby, I need you to go in this direction. Mm -hmm. But we see those hurdles. And one of those hurdles is rejection. Because, of course, we always think we are so super fabulous because that's our confidence, that's our resilience. But we also have to understand reality. And that means that we have to work hard. We have to get in there and understand what we're about to do. We can't ask for, you know, a slide. We have to put in the work in order to get to where we need to be. I feel like this cast, um, I feel like this cast should make acting their hobbies and all run for office. I feel like that should happen. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Dion and um, we talked about representation and the first time that I saw myself represented was on Alvin Ailey's uh, American Dance Theater. And so I, this question is to Billy. Um, I know that you're on the new recording and I just want to know what that experience was like because Ailey is so spiritual. Revelations is wow. so, you know. Okay, this is a diva that knows the, the, the work, honey. That's here. <laughs> You know, that's reaching, that's reaching way beyond Wikipedia. Okay. Um, I started dancing uh, in high school. I had to get out of my circumstance. I knew that I could sing. I was in every singing class and every music class and every dance class and every acting class that I could be in to get out. The dance teachers wanted me to go to ALE. The acting teachers wanted me to go to acting school. The music teachers wanted me to go to music school. You know, so by the time I got to high school, I was sort of trying to do all of these things. And Revelations was one of the spaces where um, black artists, we saw ourselves. And that, you know, and when you were learning modern dance at that time, Alvin, Ailey, and, D and DTH, Dance Theater of Harlem, were the big black, you know, so you, the, we learned the vocabulary, we learned the language. So I ended up going to drama school. I did get into the, the Alvin Ailey school, but I ended up going to drama school. Um, fast forward to like 10, 15 years later, I am doing Broadway shows. I'm a session singer in New York. Uh, Judith Jamison puts out a, a call for a, a new recording for session singers. So, I was a session singer. They called me for the session. I was like, oh yeah, I will be doing that. <laughs> and I get there and it's just a group of people. We got the scores, we're singing it, we're singing it. So there's a break. <clears throat> and at the break, I, um, they were listening to playback and I knew the choreography. So I planted myself, this is knowing where you're going. This is knowing what you're doing, right? I had all the information, babies. So I sat in the studio, and you know, in the music studio where we, were, where we were singing. All the other singers, they didn't know what they were singing. They had never sung it before, so they didn't know where the swells were supposed to happen or anything. I knew what the choreography was, so I know, knew what was going to happen. So they're, they're listening to the playback, and I literally start doing the choreography in the studio on the other side of the glass. And just as I suspected, Judith Jamison was like, who is that? <laughs> I'm Billy Porter, Miss Jamison, how are you? I said, I would like a crack at Center Man when we get there. And she was like, oh, okay. Didn't know my name, didn't know nothing. She was like, I, I, I would like a crack at Center Man. She's like, oh, okay. So <laughs> like three days later, she's like, well, this young man said he wanted a crack at it. And I went and I sang that shit and that first take is the one they've used for the last 15 
20 years. Make, make no mistake. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew exactly what I was doing. It, you know, I mean, you know, success is when opportunity and, pre and preparation meet. You know, you got to be prepared for when the moment comes, because if it comes and you're not prepared, you will gag. <laughs> We're not going to top that. We're getting the wrap-up sign tonight. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Post season two comes on in early June. Thank you very much.